So welcome everyone, including Zoom people. Um, so Benjamin Doyon is a professor at King's College London, London, England. And he's a professor in the Department of Mathematics, in fact. So he's a physicist in the mathematics department, mm -hmm. um, which is a peculiar match, but he's been able to uh, juggle between the two quite, uh, quite well. Um, and prior to that, he was a lecturer at Durham University. And before that, he was a postdoc in Oxford. Um, with whom did you work with? Uh, John Carney. John Carney. Mm -hmm. okay. Here we go, John Carney. He was lucky to work with John uh, and took his PhD at Rutgers in the US. But his career started in Quebec in the University of Laval, where he mm -hmm. did his bachelor's in physics or in, uh, in physics, yeah. Physics. yeah. Mm -hmm. so eventually, eventually, the more mathematics. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, and Benjamin, an expert uh, in one of these systems, uh, integrability, hydro, anything one be. And also entanglement, he was one of the pioneers about computing entanglement measures for quantum systems, uh, different things like twist operators and understanding how to work in different field theories, um, and many more things. So, Michelin has been very prolific. And today we'll hear about one recent thing that he's been working on, and many people in uh, the physics community, but also something that have been working on, which is the hydrodynamics of integrable systems. And so we'll yeah, talk in the moment. The floor is yours for a few minutes and uh, I'll ask you for uh, Right. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, William, for this uh, nice introduction. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, pleasure to be here. So, this is something I've been working on uh, since about 2016, actually, it's been the past four or five years. Uh, well, I was working on many things, but uh, this has been kind of my main research area in these past uh, four, five, five, six years. And um, yeah, so this is about the hydrodynamics of uh, many body integrable systems. Okay, so it is about hydrodynamics. Because before I work, was working on that, I was not an expert in hydrodynamics, but now I'm starting to know a bit what this is about. And it's also about integrable systems, which was my area of expertise before that. Certainly, I started actually doing integrable quantum field theory, and now I'm kind of going uh, more general integrable system. So the idea behind that, we just a little picture there is uh, the idea of emergence, meaning um, what happens when you have many, many particles or whatever uh, spins in interactions and you look at very large scales. Uh, can you describe what happens at these large scales without the need to describe the individual trajectories of every particle? So for instance, you know, the atmosphere is a lot, there's a lot of atoms of oxygen and all kinds of things in it, but you don't need to know all trajectories to describe a tornado. This is, uh, um, uh, the equation of hydrodynamics, essentially. So hydro is a, is, a, is a theory for emergent behaviors in this sense, right? It's a theory for what happens at very large scales. And this is the idea behind all of this work. You want, you want to look at what happens at large scales in integrable systems. So use hydro as a theory of emergent behaviors. It's not just emergent behaviors. It's, also, it's about uh, behaviors where things you know, move in space-time, so out of equilibrium, so where, where there's a dynamics. So it's the emergent dynamics in many body systems. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, just uh, the basic thing, so I'm just talking about hydrodynamics. Well, let me recall old, you know, what is hydrodynamics, you know, textbook stuff, right? Even sim simplified textbook stuff, of course. So if you think about hydrodynamics, you will think about, say, the Euler equation, the continuity equation. So this is a basic hydrodynamic equation that you will find in textbooks. What it means, it means that you look at um, your gas of particle or your fluid, and uh, here is more like a gas. And uh, you say, well, there's a conservation of mass in this gas, right? So this is the first equation that tells you that there should be local conservation of mass. Uh, rho is a mass density, or have the particle density, if every particle has the same mass. And there's a velocity in this equation, uh, and there's Euler equation, which controls that velocity. So Euler equation is actually conservation of momentum, right? There are two equations, and with these two field, uh, the field of uh, density of particles, the field of uh, local velocity, you can describe what happens at large scales in a gas with a huge amount of particles, right? That's a very simple thing. There's one function you need to know, which is a pressure, which function of rho here in this simplified version of hydrodynamics and, uh, you know, simplified in one dimensional. And uh, once you know this function, well, you kind of know everything. So given a model, you will have to find the pressure and then you know how your many particle model kind of a, uh, move in space time at very large scale. Right? So, I'm going to be more precise later on what I mean by large scale. 
There's actually another equation which is a similar type, which is the Liouville equation, which represents also conservations, conservation of phase space elements in phase space. Uh, that's a very natural equation. And where does it occur? Well, you can think of that as an equation for what happens when you have non-interacting particles. So if particles don't interact with each other and kind of just they are just a bunch of freely propagating particles, well, you know that they will preserve phase space just simply by, by the basic Hamiltonian equations for, for non-interacting particles. And uh, so these are two very different equations. They have very different physics, of course, but they both are equations for many particles kind of together when you look from far away enough so that you smooth out the discreteness of particles and uh, you want to discover what's happening. Now, the one point that I want to make is that these two equations actually are uh, consequences of uh, um, the same set of principles. And these are the general principles of hydrodynamics. So even the second equation is actually a hydrodynamic equation where you have density in phase space and vertical space. It's also a hydrodynamic equation in, of some way, in some way. And in integrable systems, you have something which is kind of in between these two equations. So it's a bit like the first one, and it's a bit like the second one, a uh, kind of a hybrid between these two, uh, because of the properties of integrable systems. And it's still hydrodynamic equation. And one of the big thing about this is, was that beforehand, people didn't think that hydro could be used for integrable systems because integrable systems are so special. Uh, but now we understand that these general principles can indeed be used, and in fact, lead to this you know, even simple simple Liouville equation. So there's some very general uh, set of principles that, that can be used. Okay. So that's kind of an uh, introduction of the ideas here. Now, what kind of integrable systems am I talking about? I give you, uh, so one of the thing about this theory that is kind of widely applicable. So I give you some examples of integrable systems that I have in mind, and they all follow the same kind of, uh, th there's a single equation that will describe their hydrodynamics. There are just certain elements that equation that need to be adjusted. Basically, a single equation, like a universal equation for integrable systems. Okay. One of them is the KDV equation, which you know is integrable. It itself represents shallow water waves, which is, so it's, it is itself actually a hydro equation of some sort, but you know, think of it as a microscopic equation and uh, think of it as the hydrodynamics of that. I'll tell you just now what I mean by that. But this is, this is a dynamical equation for a field in space time. And you can think of uh, this field as being fluctuating and, and try to look at what happens when the field fluctuates and evolve under this equation. Well, that's an integrable model. Okay? Another type of integrable model you can think of is, you know, uh, for instance, the singe gordon classical or quantum. This is now uh, expressed in terms of a Hamiltonian. It's actually relativistically invariant. KDV is not, but this is a relativistic model. Also will satisfy the same set of uh, uh, Hadley equation. Okay? And I'll tell you a bit more precisely how. Another type of, uh, of uh, models is this, something called the tongs gas or the hard, the hard, um, uh, hard rod gas. What, what is that? It's just a set of rods, so little segments on the line that move freely except when they collide with each other. Okay? So they have a certain length. So this is a very different model from the first two one. The first two one are fields in space time. This is just a gas of particles. And yes, the same set of, the same equations of what, of what we call generalized hydrodynamics that will describe its own hydrodynamics. And here you can see what hydrodynamics means. You, you look at that say from very far, and then there's a bunch of, there's a lot of particle there and less there, and then you can do a density velocity type of approximation and try to derive a hydro, right? And another, it just finally, right? Whoops, sorry. Another model is a quantum model. So this is a, something that is realized in experiments in cold atomic experiments. Uh, and this is the Liebniger quantum Hamiltonian. Again, it's a, it's a bunch of particles, right? So the Xi are particles. This is Hamiltonian in first quantization. And, uh, but it's quantum and the particles <coughs> in, interact with the delta function potential with some, with some uh, strength G, okay? And all of these models have uh, the same universal uh, Hadoo equation, okay? Now, what kind of, of um, a situation would I, want to do, would I want to describe in these models? So I don't want to describe the exact solution, you know, u of x comma t from a given exact initial condition, right? This can be done by inverse scattering. People have studied that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of information about that. Same thing for this Hamiltonian, you know, I can do inverse scattering. Even the quantum uh, Hamiltonian, I can do better on that, right? So there's a lot of techniques that are available. You give initial condition and you try to evolve it. You find the eigen energies and all that. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking about things which are out of equilibrium where the standard techniques don't work anymore. That was one of the reasons why you, you know, we like to do hydro for integrable systems. This standard technique that work well at equilibrium somehow failed to work beyond equilibrium. So for the KDD equation, what you can think about is 
take a, a random initial condition. So random will give it some measure, some measure for your initial condition. Okay. So this is my field u of x comma zero. It's kind of just by hand, right? It's nothing very specific. And then you know evolve it in time. So uh, you evolve a measure on the field, and you get as time evolve a measure. Okay. So you can do that. And if you want this to be really out of equilibrium. Uh, what you could do is make it random, but the randomness is different in different points in space. A bit like a gas, right? You have more particles there and less particles there. Okay. Yes. Is u a function or a random variable? Yeah. So indeed. So here, what I want to say is u is a random function. So a function with a measure. I haven't written the measure there, but I would have a measure on u. You know, mu of u uh, dot comma zero. You know. And uh, you know, I have to determine the measure. And people have been studying this kind of thing. In the context of soliton gas, the measure is determined in a very specific fashion. How it is determined, actually, you, you construct by inverse scattering uh, soliton solutions, say n solitons, and then you kind of uh, randomize uh, the phases of the solitons or kind of the position of the soliton, essentially, the asymptotic position. But this seems a little bit like Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So this is actually a very good point. So. Uh, what uh, the equation that I've written here, they are deterministic actually. And I want to keep determinism in the evolution because you can also do hydrodynamics with stochastic evolution, definitely. I mean, people have, have been doing that for some time and you can get quite uh, um, accurate mathematical results with this. But with in random initial condition and deterministic evolution, that's a more difficult. No, no, exactly. So you have initial measure, measure initial condition. And then you evolve that. So of course the measure then evolves. So that's the that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually an excellent question, which is clarified in my next slide when I look at the Singe Gordon model, because there is can do things a bit more precise. I have a Hamiltonian for so a temperature. Right? I could have put a temperature for KDV as well, but I'll do it for that model. Okay. So here's an example, explicit example of in a, a non equilibrium situation, if you wish. Okay. So my initial condition is something that looks like thermal. You see, I have an exponential, um, but it's so exponential of something that looks like a, a Boltzmann weight, where you integrate H is the energy density for, for the, the sine Gordon Hamilton. But I put for the left bit of the system a given temperature, and for right bit another temperature. So this is out of equilibrium because it's two different temperatures. Now, this is just a measure that I write by hand. I can write anything, right? But this is why not I could write that. If beta left is equal to beta right, then that's just Boltzmann, that's, you know, kind of a Boltzmann measure, Boltzmann weight, and that would be equilibrium. Okay, so that is that. But then it's different, so it's out of equilibrium. Now, if I start evolving that, so in other words, what I can do is put the measure on the initial condition and then evaluate something at time t, yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. That's how I, I think of it. If I go back, oops, what happened there? Okay. Cette page contient une erreur. Uh -huh. Okay, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> I'm, you can contain an error. That's fine. So this is yeah. This is the canonical variable in the in the Singe Gordon. No. And uh, I mean, you know, I can write any other type of measure. I just write this one because I, I can explain it. I can work with it. Um, if the betas were equal, this measure with uh, d phi d pi, would, it's an invariant measure on the devolution because it's canonical. And that would also be invariant because it would be the total Hamiltonian and then you'd have equilibrium. But now the difference, this, is not, this one is not invariant on the evolution, yeah, so you don't have out equilibrium. So you can think of that as averaging the field, the phi field of Singe Gordon evolved up to time t from an, some initial condition where the initial condition has that measure. So it's perfectly well defined. You put that in a computer, which we did. We put it in a computer and we check what, what we obtain. And what we obtain is something that tends at a very large time to depend on x over t on the collapses on function of x over t of, with a certain shape. And the point is that there's a theory that can describe this shape very precisely. Does this make sense? Yeah. What's on the vertical axis? I'm sorry, I'm here. Yeah, so the vertical oh, axis, okay. no, no, sorry, it's a bit small. <laughs> so the vertical axis is the average, is exactly that that quantity there, this whole thing with alpha equals two, just a choice too. And this is a numer numerical evaluation of this whole thing. Okay? So we measure initial condition, evolve the field and check what we get, average that. Yeah. 
So that's the kind of situation. This is called the Riemann problem or, or, or partitioning protocol uh, in uh, nearby physics or uh, hydrogen. So the question. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you, so you can, here I write it as a distribution of initial condition and evolve the field, but then phi of x comma t is of course a random variable. It has its own distribution. And I can write the distribution. So the theory tells me what the distribution is in some approximation, very large time. Yeah, uh, zero temperature is the fixed, the, yeah. Uh, exactly, zero temperature is to have a fixed uh, field, which you would evolve, then you can do uh, inverse scattering and it's pretty precise, you know, and all that. But the problem with that is that you have a distribution and then inverse scattering is not so immediately useful. It's kind of more difficult. But you can do the numeric, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Why x over t? Why x over t? Because this uh, in initial condition is uh, homogeneous except at uh, one single point. And it's not sufficient, of course, as an as a explanation. And the emergent equation that describes that is of Euler equation, Euler type, hydrodynamic equation, which is invariant on the simultaneous scaling of x and t. So it's emergent. So, uh, yeah. So you know you have to know that there's hydro behind that to, to know this. No question. Yeah, it depends on the temperature, but drastically, I mean, you know, I, if I change the temperature, the curve changes a little bit last time, but I mean not that much. Of course, if you go to zero temperature, then yes. It's, it's, yeah. Other question. So if I go a bit further in that direction. Uh, one can do the Riemann problem for the hard rods as well. Uh, oh yeah, this is what is not, okay. There was a picture there, but it's not showing. It doesn't matter, it's a similar picture. As a, it was kind of a simulation of hard rods. So the, again, you know, here you look at the density of the rods around the point X. So you have a measure on the initial positions and momenta of the rods. And the measure is just canonical measure again, but here is something more, more general. Maybe I should go with the mouse. Something more general instead of putting uh, the energy, I, could, I put some arbitrary function of momentum there and there, two different functions. I can do that as well. So this is not thermal, this is beyond thermal, right? And uh, this is my initial condition with the only requirement is that is hard rod, they don't overlap the rods. Then you evolve it with the hard rod dynamics and you look at what happened at time t, how many particles there, there is at position x and time t. You can evaluate that, you can do numerics for this, you know, kind of molecular dynamics. And again, there's prediction for this for arbitrary function W left, W right, W left, W right. Yeah. Really, really, uh, really. yeah, the Riemann problem is, is something that uh, Riemann supposedly studied. I don't know the full history, but it's something in the context of hydrodynamics where you, your initial condition for your hydro, you know, it's a hydrodynamic equation, is something that is equilibrium on some, on one side of the system and different equilibrium on the other side. And, you know, otherwise, so just a single point that changes. And it's well known, people study that in hydro. Uh, for instance, you have a lot of gas here, you have nothing there, what happens then that evolves and then there's all kind of things that happen. Shocks can develop and uh, things like that. So it's, it's, it's a typical problem in the context of hyperbolic equations. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. No, it's a differential equation indeed, yes. Actually, to be precise, it's a differential equation. And here I show it as being something probabilistic. Maybe I should more call it the, the, the partitioning protocol. People have called it this way, or the domain wall initial condition, people have called it this way. But it, it maps then to a hydrodynamics Riemann problem when you do the hydro of it, yes. Other question. So that's another time. And then uh, finally, sorry, this direction. Yeah, another situation you can do, so sorry, I you know, spend some time with the various situations, but I think it's important to frame the problem. You can take the, the problem of quantum atoms, right? So the, the quantum problem of atoms interacting with the function uh, interaction. And there you could do different things. But one of the things you can do, which is very natural and doable in experiments, is the following. So you, you first uh, thermalize your atoms in some given potential that is inhomogeneous. For instance, that one which has two a minima, so then you have two kind of bumps of densities naturally, right? There's more, part, more particle there and less there. And then you suddenly change the potential, it's called a quench. For instance, you can put it to zero, then the atoms expand. This is the expansion phenomenon. 
And then you could expect that these two bumps will start moving towards the right and left and expanding a little bit and all kinds of things. And this is also a typical problem that you can do with Hadoop dynamics, study that, you know, study the Hadoop dynamic equation for that type of initial condition. But here we think of it in terms of many body system and the, the formulation is very precise, right? You have initial, uh, 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 initial potential in that Hamiltonian, plus or minus beta H, but you evoke with a different potential, right? H evolution, which you just change the V here and that's it, okay? And we have prediction for what happens there. Now this is special because you see that the, the initial Hamiltonian has a potential V of X in it, right? So there's non-zero potential. And that full Hamilton with the non-zero V is actually not integrable. V breaks integrability. Nevertheless, the techniques of integrability can be used to describe what's happening there. That if V is varies on large enough scales, okay? Um, yeah, no question. And maybe finally, <laughs> sorry, but finally one can look at, whoops, this direction, not just evolution, but also correlation functions. Now you take really a, in an equilibrium state, for instance, the singe Gordon model, exponential minus beta h. This is no, uh, no ambiguity. And you look at correlation functions in space time. Because they are in space time, it's kind of non equilibrium. It's like, you know, things evolving in space time. And Hadro also has prediction for that. Okay. So Hadro is extremely powerful you know, for evolution of stuff and for correlation functions in space time. Again, this is a kind of a probabilistic you know, consideration, right? You have a, you have a measure on your, on your phi. Okay, so um, now, yes, in this direction. So the point is that there is a kind of a single universal framework which we have called generalized Hadoop dynamics. Although actually this terminology was already used before us for something different, which we had not realized. But if you kind of Google generalized Hadoop dynamics before 2016, it's something else. And now is that, so apologies for that. Um, but uh, so we called that and this somehow describes all the situations which, which I have uh, explained, okay? Now, what is the equation? I just show you the equation, then I tell you a bit where it comes from. So at least you have, a, you know, what the equation is, and then if you don't want to know where it comes from, then well, fine. So what is the equation? Is a question that looks a bit like the Liouville equation, okay? For a, a single function, a rho, which depends on space, time, and on a, a momentum-like parameter, which is called rapidity, theta, okay? Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a hydrodynamic type equation. In fact, it's a hyperbolic equation except it has, uh, instead of the usual hyperbolic equation, which have uh, X and T, this has X and T and theta. It's like a continuum of hyperbolic equation, okay? Uh, it has in it a density. The density allows you to calculate uh, all, uh, all the physical quantities of interest, or many physical quantities of interest, okay? For instance, in KDV, the average of U is integration of that density times theta, okay? That density in that case is a density of solitons. It's a physically meaning of the steel solitons in space time. And theta is a parameter, a spectral parameter for the soliton. So there are many solitons can have any velocity. So theta is like the velocity of the soliton. Okay? And you have a density of such thing. Well, uh, in the singe Gordon, uh, in hard rod gas, this will be the density of rods where theta is the velocities. And the singe Gordon, well, for instance, the average of the 2G phi is some known complicated function of this row. And that row now has the meaning of density of, uh, well, essentially, well, in quantum stage it will be the density of beta roots. So, you know that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so actually I'm gonna come to that. Uh, this, this is not the best type possible because I should explain that actually. But I'll come to the, in some limit, yeah. I'll come to the precise limit for the KDV. Uh, I'll come to this. So, uh, so there's a precise definition of this role, of course. And this, it's actually a bit, a bit subtle, <laughs> precise so definition of it. Infinite. Yeah, you need to have an infinite number of solitons. This is the limit of large systems where you have an infinite number of solitons with some finite density of solitons per unit space. So you need to kind of be able to determine, you know, solitons per space. Yeah. Yeah. Order. Yes. And that just gives you a Yes. Correct. Yeah. I don't think you need that. No. You want solitons that are somehow stochastic. Yes. Correctly. So kind of some some uh, random distribution of soliton with with fixed density, and you want in fact you know a measure on such solitons with fixed density, but uh, in practice you don't actually need to take a measure. You can take a single configuration where your solitons are kind of random enough. But the single one evolves it, and that will be sufficient. Then you're going to have 
essentially will average out, you know. Yeah. But now these model is the same equation where the row, which has a slightly different definition in all of these models, a satisfied equation and, and allows you to calculate physical quantities. Uh, and uh, there's another object in this equation, which is the so-called effective velocity. And this is a bit like uh, the pressure. This, is the, this encodes the model dependence. The rest is just rho is the same. Okay, it has a definition that depends on the, on the model, but it's rho is rho. And the effective velocity, now that depends specifically on what model you're looking at. What, if it's KDV, St. Gordon, or something else, has a, a quantity in it that depends, that tells you about the model. And the quantity is this delta. So V effective, we don't know how to write it explicitly, but it satisfies a linear integral equation, which you can put on a computer, right, in principle, uh, where there's a, there, there's a parameter delta in it that depends on the model. And for various models, this delta is known and takes various forms. It's related to the two-body scattering matrix, which I'll come to. Okay. So, you know, for all these models, this is the equation that describes the evolution in the homogeneous uh, setup. And uh, for, the, for the setup that I was discussing, you have to have some initial conditions. So there's a row of theta x comma zero that you need to fix. And then you evolve with that equation that describes what you should see, okay? And how to fix it, this is by other methods, which I won't go into, but something called thermodynamic beta and SAS. It's, it's more the more standard methods. Yeah. The, the what? The R matrix to V. Yeah, 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 indeed, yes. So essentially back to R matrix, which encodes scattering, delta is related to that, precisely. Another question. Yeah. If you take some rational CFT. Yes. Which, you know, one, you know, always so for rational CFTs, okay, so, uh, yeah, so what you need for this to make sense, you need to have a scattering theory. So you need your many body system to have well-defined scattering states. And delta has to be, has to do with the scattering, with two body scattering. So soliton gas is clear, you know, scattering is fine. You can start with solitons and all that. Since Gordon as well, and all these models have, have nice scattering theory. CFT doesn't, yeah. it is possible to, this, to, to write a scattering theory for CFT. But, uh, and, and I think it would be interesting then to, to write this up, but I haven't done it yet. So what if you do two from the critical point? Yes, then, then you have a scattering theory and then you have delta. So, uh, so perturbed CFTs, I mean, for instance, sine Gordon, right? It can be seen as a perturbed CFT, but there's a, many other perturbed CFTs where you can calculate delta by various methods and that will work. And it's delta that, that we put there. And you can take the limit towards CFT and then put the delta there. And that would be the scattering theory of CFT. And supposedly that would work, but it hasn't been checked so much. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so this, this is the equation. So for all these models, there's, there's a delta you can fix. There's a row that's related to physical quantities and you, and you describe the result. Now, let me tell you where this comes from. What are the main ideas, by the way? How am I doing in time? Um, yeah. Yeah. 25 minutes, which is good, yeah, thanks, perfect, and mid, mid talk. So uh, let me tell you what the, the fundamental ideas are. So these are the principles of hydrodynamics that you can apply to kind of uh, almost everything or to many, many things uh, that lead to these equations that lead to the initial two equations that I wrote in the, in the second slide, right? The basic hydro equation and UV equation as well, okay? So what are the, the principles that follow? So what you say is that you'd like to describe some um, macro, some uh, what you see macroscopically, right? So macroscopic behavior, right? Now, the idea is that, well, you know, it, it, the idea is that, well, you have some initial conditions, something happened, but things should smooth out more. I mean, there's a bit of physical ideas behind that. Right? So if things smooth out, then that means that you could look, say, in some little region in space or some other little region in space, and the region is small enough, it will look like it's, uh, um, it's a, it's a thermodynamic state, a state where things are homogeneous and stationary. So local homogeneous stationary states is what kind of the, the main idea of hydrodynamics. Right? So you, you look around here and then the particles or perhaps the KDV field, sine Gordon field, whatever, looks you know, random, there's some distribution, but uh, homogeneous and stationary, so it's, you know, it, it's some homogeneous state, state that is invariant on the translation and stationary invariant on the, on the uh, uh, evolution. Okay. It's not exactly homogeneous, but at least on large, on, on kind of mesoscopic scale, it, it's homogeneous stationary. But then on larger scale, then it starts changing. 
So, you know, there's a scale separation of hydrodynamics. So this is called the fluid cell. This is called the mesoscopic cell as well. And if you were to look macroscopically, then you'd have the trajectories of the particles, but then you want to forget about that. It's too complicated, right? So this mesoscopic scale is much greater than the microscopic scale. We, you, you don't see particles, but it's much smaller than the macroscopic scale. You don't see the variations on large scale. Anyway, the idea. Now, what do you do with that? Well, you kind of put some mathematics to it with few assumptions, which you can try to make precise more and more as you, you know, go along. Um, so you have your many body system. And um, so, how, so the, the, the basic uh, so idea, so here I'm talking about states now that's so the but the basic objects for hydrodynamics are the conservation laws and then you you relate the conservation laws to the states that you can obtain okay so these are the two things so there's the conservation laws and the state so you don't need to know a lot about your your microscopic models you just need to know uh what is conserved and what are the densities and occurrence so for instance if you have a usable chaotic model where well, you know momentum is conserved particles are conserved energy is conserved and nothing else. So you'd have three conservation laws, and, and that's the basis of uh, usual hydro. But if you have three particles, then all the momenta uh, you know, of the individual particles are conserved. So actually, the number of particles at momentum P is conserved if particles are free. So then you have a huge amount of such conservation law, a continuum of, of them. Okay, so that's, that's the difference, right? And once you know these conservation laws uh, somehow, then you can construct uh, the state. The question is, you know, what, what are these, these states that are written there, these homogeneous and stationary states? And the uh, physical idea is that uh, locally things should thermalize, but there may be something more general than thermalize. So you should get to a Gibbs form that involves all the conserved quantities. So you assume, this is an assumption of hydrodynamics, right? You don't prove that. You assume that locally you'll be able to describe your system by something that looks like a Gibbs distribution, but involving all the conserved quantities. So the conserved quantities are the space integral of the conserved densities. You might have a continuum of these. So the I index may be a continuum index, right? Integration then, or you might have three of these, right? So that's the idea. Now, um, what do you do with this? So uh, basically you do two things. The first thing is you do the hydrodynamic approximation, which is exactly the picture I had in the previous slide. So you say that if you evaluate any observable at space time point xt from your initial random distribution, you should be able to approximate that by the average of that very observable in a state that is of Gibbs form. But the Gibbs, poten the Gibbs potential, so these beta i's, may depend on where you are in space time because you have different homogeneous stationary states. That's your approximation is, and this little innocuous equation is extremely important and very powerful. In particular, on the left-hand side, there are a lot of local observables you can, you can have. This is a huge amount. So there's a lot of degrees of freedom. While on the right-hand side, there's just as many degrees of freedom betas as there are conserved quantities, which is this. So this is a reduction of the number of degrees of freedom that's, that's the basis of hydrodynamics. Okay? So you reduce number of degrees of freedom. In typical cases, you reduce to three functions instead of infinitely many functions. Um, and then you write down the conservation law these conservation law, but at the level of the averages. So you write down these conservation laws for the average densities and the average currents, which are both now functions of these states, beta of xt. Okay? So this equation is an equation for uh, um, um, uh, Lagrange parameters that characterize the state. Okay? So you have as many equations as you have conserved quantities, and as many betas as you have conserved quantities, so this is enough. So that's your dynamics on the state. So this, this is uh, Euler hydrodynamics. Essentially, that's it. Right? So, so you know, if you look at the book on Euler hydrodynamics, this is the basic principle. Then you can do stuff out of that, right? See what, what, you, what are the consequences of this equation. Okay? But this is it. To apply it to a model, you just need to do the conserved quantities and the states, the average density and the average currents. And you write this equation, and you have your hydro equation. Okay? Any questions about this? Now, the question is to apply that to you know, interesting models. Um, you can write this equation in different ways. So if you kind of work this out a little bit, since J is function of betas and betas are also function of Q by inverting that equation, you can write the currents as function of the density. That's a usual way of doing in hydro. It's called the equation of state. For instance, the pressure is the momentum current, which is written as function of the density of particles. That's a typical thing. And then you get the quasi linear form of the equation and this matrix that occurs there, which is called the flux Jacobian, encodes the hydrodynamic velocities. 
So if you modify your gas a little bit at what velocity will it go at? Well, these are, these are the eigenvalues of this A matrix. So if you do linear response, you see that this is what's happening. So this is kind of a crash course on hydrodynamics. I mean, just very basic things hydro. And this is it as a structure would like to apply to integrable system. Now there's some uh, things to understand. What does it describe? It describes the earlier scaling limit. So here's a kind of a precise limit that's supposed to be described by such equation. Uh, you, so the limit is you look at some local observable, whatever it is, at space-time point that are taken very, very large, very far. So it's microscopic. In some initial state that is taken to be also varying on a very large scale in the limit when that scale that lambda goes to infinity if the limit exists what you obtain is something that is precisely described by this equation that's earlier scaling limit right okay? uh, and the other thing to which is very important is that in, in all this description i never needed to assume anything specific about the microscopic dynamics so it may or may not be chaotic that is completely independent from the hydrodynamic uh, principles hydro principles apply whatever what will change if it's chaotic, you don't, you have much less conserved quantity. If it's integrable, you have more, but independently, the principles are the same. Okay, no question. <clears throat> yes, indeed, exactly. So the, because we take exactly that scaling limit, you lose a scale, you lose a scale, as earlier scaling limit. And then, you know, if the limit exists, of course, you've got to show that limit exists, which is not necessarily the case, you know, that's always the case. Or it may exist in a weak sense. Yeah. Other question. Okay, now the point is to apply that to this integrable system, and the idea is a, is a scattering. So, so here, uh, uh, yes, go ahead. The way most people would read is like yes. the integrable systems in higher dimensions. Yes, this is an interesting question, which I thought a bit about. So, this is all 1D. Uh, in principle, all these things can be done in higher D without any problem, what I've said till now, you know, for hydro. But the problem is that in higher D, the relation between the conserved quantities and the asymptotic states is not as clear, as far as I understand. So even higher D integrable models, you know, there are techniques, there's, there's, there's notion of integrability, but how to, this, how to relate the asymptotic states, which is what I'm gonna use to parameterize my conserved charges, to the actual conserved charge and make a hydro, this is not clear yet. This is still to be done, yeah? Other question? Okay, so now the point is to specify a bit what the conserved charges are, what the conserved density is now that, and the point here is to use the notion of asymptotic states. So, meaning that you have your many body system and uh, you think of it as, a, you know, whatever gas you have as coming from or leading to at large time, uh, freely propagating objects, which may be particles, solitons, uh, kind of a wave, quantum waves, whatever. Okay? So scattering theory for your many-body system. Okay? And you're gonna use these freely propagating objects, this as a characteristics of the conserved charges in order to write the hydrodynamics. Okay? So basically it's as if, uh, well, okay, so I should say in fact, the main property of integrability in the asymptotic description is that these objects, they have uh, mom momenta, you know, and various quantum numbers, but because of integrability, that is what we use in, in the description, that's what we mean by integrability, because of integrability, the set of initial momenta and set of final momenta in any scattering process uh, is the same. So this is uh, elastic uh, scattering, so uh, the momenta are preserved. Uh, and further, this full you know, many body scattering uh, process can be divided into a whole bunch of separate two body scattering processes. So this is factorized scattering. And so this is the assumption behind the whole theory, which we use in, in, in various ways. And with this assumption, then, then you get the structure of generalized hydrodynamics. Okay? So you have to have factorized scattering and uh, conservation of all momenta. So that means that all the momenta, every momentum can be seen as a conserved quantity. And, you know, the, the density of a certain asymptotic momentum is conserved. And the way they interact is via the two-body scattering. Let me give you an example, the example of the hydro, which is simple, but which kind of encodes everything you need to know, actually, almost. So here is the, the rods that interact with each other and that hit each other and all that. Now, um, uh, so certainly the set of momenta is preserved because when they hit each other, they exchange the momenta. It's kind of just, you know, same mass uh, uh, elastic, elastic uh, collisions. Okay? So the set of momenta is preserved. And so the density of particles at any given momenta is preserved. And so you can write, uh, your conserved quantities as something parameterized by a continuous parameter theta, which is the momentum of the velocity. Right? 
It's very simple to write explicitly. It's just that quantity there where Q is just data function theta in X. You look at, at, at position X and versus theta, how many particles you have. You integrate over, over X to have the full constant quantity. So it's kind of distribution then in, in theta, but when you integrate, uh, okay, it becomes okay. So when, when you do the uh, integrate over the measure, then it becomes a well-behaved uh, quantity. And then you write down your, your, um, your so this is your constant quantity. Then you want, you want to write down your, the set of all possible uh, um, maximal entropy states, the, the states that are homogeneous and stationary, the Gibbs of Gibbs form. And it's simple. So as I said here, this is a continuum of constant quantity. So you integrate over all theta times this Q of theta, which effectively simply says that you put a weight W for, you know, for a given function W on every momentum PI. So it's time over I W of PI. If W is the, is P, is, um, if W of P is P square over two, that would be just the energy, but it can be any other function, okay? So you have a, a whole, uh, a large family of states which are parameterized by a function. So you have a, a lot of states, but of course a lot of constant quantity as well. Now you want to do, um, so you'd like to calculate uh, uh, the average density as function of theta. This is what I call rho, P of this rho is that, just the average density as function of theta in these states. This function of W, one can calculate that explicitly. It's so it's a simple model. Uh, so Q theta is a function of W, the average of density can be calculated. But you, you can forget about W, which characterizes the, the kind of the, the measure. You can instead, instead just think about uh, the average of the conserved density uh, to the average of this quantity, the average of that within that state. And that's a sufficient characterization okay, function. And then you want to construct not just the average density, but the average current, right? Because for the hydrodynamics, you have both, uh, you have an equation that relate the density to the current. You have a continuity equation. So you should like to calculate the average currents as function of W. And for this is a bit more complicated because you don't say have explicitly the current, but you can do a, the following argument. In fact, you can calculate that precisely, but the following argument is perfectly fine. And the argument is as follows. You look at uh, a, a test rod and how it goes within a gas of rod, okay? So, and you look at what, what is the velocity of that test rod within a gas of rod. And you say that, well, if I just multiply the, that velocity by the density of rods, I should get the correct average current. Okay. It's, it's kind of a large scale type of argument, dynamical argument, okay. and it's actually correct in the end. Um, so what, is this, what does this test rod do within the gas? Well, of course it goes its own little way and sometimes it hits other particles. Well, I want to look at the current of given momentum. So I, sh I better follow the momentum. So not do quite the test rod, but the test velocity tracer. So it goes in the gas then exchange its velocity. So then I, I jump to the other rod and I continue following the path of that and jump to the other rod and continue following the path of that. So that kind of test momentum goes within the gas at a given velocity that depends on how many rods it hits. Every time it hits a rod, it jumps a little bit forward. So there is an emerging effective velocity, which is, you know, the sum, you know, the, the distance over time where the distance is due to the freely propagating rods plus the jumps that occur at every rod collision. So you follow a given momentum, you have to follow, you have to jump like that. And you can write a, a, a simple, you know, think about a simple kinematic, kinematic argument, not kinematic, uh, kind of yeah, kinetic argument to see what this is. Basically you add what well, the basic velocity, the bare velocity, and you add all the jumps. So delta is the jumps that occur. In this case is minus A, A is the length of the rod and is negative sign for, um, for convention. And you look at number of particles that are being hit by theta and uh, the difference of effective velocity, which is the probability that you're gonna hit a particle which has a different velocity. So if the two particles have the same effective velocity, they will kind of never hit each other, but if they are slightly different, they will hit each other at some point. So there's an argument for that. And uh, this equation is nothing else but the effective velocity equation that I wrote before, okay? And what you get is, um, uh, so you write down then your conservation law. So dtq plus dxj equals zero, which becomes exactly the equation that I uh, wrote previously, where this the effective satisfies an integral equation. You have that, yeah. Okay. This equation was actually shown rigorously previously by other techniques, but it has an, a natural uh, physical uh, meaning. Okay. So any question about this? So basically you calculate both the density and the currents for a continuum of constant quantity. And the currents is evaluated by a kind of a kinetic argument, an argument where you sum the jumps. 
Now you can actually uh, do the same thing for the soliton gas. So here is how I define precisely the uh, soliton gas uh, distribution. Okay? So this is for KDV equation. So KDV equation, there are a lot of concepts of quantities which you can write explicitly, okay? but uh, it's not very useful to write explicitly. You rather think in terms of uh, solitons and, and their own parameterization. Now here is the solution U of XT, uh, uh, soliton, so N soliton solution. It has a property that when you go to P, uh, large time to infinity, it's just a sum of a uh, second hyperbolic square, okay? Is that, you know, single solitons. And there's a parameter in it, theta n, which parameterizes a soliton, basically is related to the velocity, okay? Um, now you, you construct a state, which is essentially, uh, um, well, you construct your row of theta, which is density of soliton, uh, like that. So it is such that if you integrate in this row between theta one and theta two, the number of solitons in that interval is simply the number of uh, n, so that this theta n in this, uh, in this solution there, a life between theta one and theta two, that number you divide by L. And then you take the limit where N, number of soliton in L, the space on which your, your, your U of X and energy lies, both go to infinity simultaneously. You can that, do that in a computer. It's perfectly doable in a computer. And you get, you get some U of X comma T like that. Okay? So that's a zero row of theta. Uh, then, you, then you define your, your QI are just rho of theta times theta. In fact, if you look at the concept of quantities there, uh, asymptotically, they are just you know, powers of theta. So you can evaluate the cost of quantities on solitons, they're just powers of theta. And then the point, this is the, the, the crucial point, is that you can also evaluate the currents, not just the density, but the currents. And it's again a dynamical argument, an argument of you look at uh, the, your gas of solitons and you imagine that you can separate your interaction into a bunch of two body interactions. So a given soliton will go through a gas of solitons by its velocity and by the jumps, the, the, the scattering shift incurred in soliton scattering. And the scattering shift in a two-body soliton scattering is easily calculable in KDV and it's given by this formula at this P delta, okay? And then because by, by this uh, uh, intuitive argument, you find exactly the same equation like in the hard rod, except now the scattering shift is more complicated and it's theta alpha dependent because it's you know, come from soliton scattering. So this is a gas of soliton where you have a soliton in a gas that goes its own way and then scatter with other solitons and gain some shifts. And from that, then you evaluate the current by multiplying by that effective velocity. So this is a kind of a study and wavy argument. You can do a numerics and you know, send a test soliton with, within you know, a configuration that has many solitons. And you do see indeed that this large, you make it large to see it, let's say test soliton indeed after some time gains an additional uh, an additional uh, displacement, which is some of all the small displacement gains in, during the interaction with all this gas. So this is exactly what's happening, and you use that to construct the effective velocity. So you get uh, the soliton gas hydrodynamic equation, which was incidentally uh, derived using inverse scattering techniques, different techniques, uh, you know, quite some time ago uh, in 2003 by getting the L and his team. Where well, generalized hydrodynamics was not quite invented at that time, but there was already this equation for soliton gas. Right? Question about this. So this is this is the main principle. Uh, I don't want to go too much in the detail. You can do something similar for the Liebniger model, where you go, uh, you look at uh, scattering waves, and the only detail is that now it's a quantum model, and you you have to extract some kind of scattering shift to do your Kind of velocity argument, and for that you do a, a semi-classical analysis. So you calculate the, the two-body scattering phase, quantum phase, and the scattering shift is just the theta derivative of the log of the two-body quantum phase. So this is now now this becomes a bit you know pushing it pushing your luck a little bit if you wish it becomes a semi-classical argument for for a velocity of you know, you know a quantum a quantum model, but nevertheless the equation that you get. Where the current is given by this effective velocity obtained, you know, with a semi-classical scattering shift, the equation uh, still is correct and was derived by other techniques, uh, by by a variety of techniques, and we derived that originally by using a crossing symmetry of uh, a relativistic uh, quantum field theory, uh, but it has the same interpretation, a posterior interpretation, okay, as as a scattering shifts, and it was then later on derived and proven using Betti and that techniques and a variety of other techniques, and then you get. Uh, this equation where rho now is a density of beta roots 
uh, in the quantum model. And with this effective velocity then has the semi classical interpretation as coming from shifts of, of uh, wave packets uh, within your quantum model. Okay? Um, yeah, so this is kind of uh, the idea behind this uh, GHG unite hydrodynamics equation. Okay? So there's a lot of conserved quantities. So you have a continuum of conserved quantities. You have a function of a continuum parameter. And uh, the Hydro equation is obtained by evaluating the average currents. And this comes from so what people call, um, um, well, it's, it's, it's a particular equation of state. Uh, and it comes from thinking about this in a semi-classical fashion or in the in context of a, a, a soliton scattering. Okay? So thinking about it in this way. But this equation was derived independently in different contexts by different techniques it's always the same equation that you get with the same interpretation. Okay. Um, question about this. Is there examples where you get this equation precisely and you get velocity from DHD, but where people have not got it in different methods? Yeah, so. Now we have this prediction. Yeah. Indeed. So, so for instance, in the classical Singe Gordon model, it has not been obtained by other methods. So, this, that classical example was not worked out by other methods. And it works because we did some numerical checks and all that. And in quantum context, well, what is there's been um, what well, better on that? Well, you know, when we say so, in quantum change, it's quite a sturdy. Okay, I should say what has been obtained in a quantum context is not that equation precisely, but is rather that equation for the average currents in in a, in one of these Gibbs states. We call it generalized Gibbs ensemble. That has been obtained by beta and that. Okay? But that equation describing the non equilibrium dynamics, this has not been obtained in the quantum context yet. So it's just this is the hydro approximation. So hydro approximation is still not really uh, kind of obtainable, it has not been obtained from more microscopic calculation yet. So this is there's a big approximation there, there's a big assumption there, which is the hydro approximation. Okay? While in the classical context, soliton gas, this equation itself has been obtained. And in hard rod as well. So quantum, there's one thing missing still there. Can you test numerically to? Yeah, and then indeed, so the test that's been done, you, the, there are some numerical tests in the, using TDMRG with XXZ, where you check, check exactly that equation for the real problem and it works. And uh, yeah, these are the stronger tests, I think. In spin chain, it's been tested. Yeah. And in quantum down, field theory, no, no test. Yeah. And it works down to the XXX. The yes, the it's been done also for XXX limit where it still works. I mean, there, there's a lot of details there about the set of um, uh, this is the beta roots, you know, the string hypothesis, hypothesis from thermodynamic beta and that comes into play and all that. But it's been done for XXX limit as well. Yes, no question. Okay, so maybe I just say so, just recap. So, this is how the equation, the basic one, conservation of conservation laws. And we use the same idea and we get that different type of conservation. It's really just how to equation. And now if you specialize this to free particles, it can be just connect here. So particles don't interact, so delta is zero. The effective velocity there just becomes the velocity, say theta, and that's the Liouville equation. So that's why Liouville equation is still a hydrodynamic equation, the free particle hydro. So yeah, now, so it's been, you asked for test, actually it's been tested in experiments. The, I cite here some few experiments. The latest one is being published in science by these people where people you know, did experiment with cold atomic gases and compare with the prediction of GHG. So let me just show the, the experiment where okay, I, was, I was part of the theory people for that experiment. Uh, this is the group of Isabel Bouchoul where she has this uh, atom chips. It's a chip, little chip there where you have wires that produce magnetic field that are able to trap uh, rubidium atoms, rubidium atoms kind of that interact man magnetically with, with the magnetic field. And you trap it by putting wires. So you put wires which are like kind of parallel, horizontal like this to make something that is essentially one dimensional. So you trap them in one dimension, so it becomes a one dimensional system. And in quantum, it works well because although it's not quite one dimensional, the transverse energies are, can be pretty high so you don't, you don't see them so much. It's pretty much one dimensional. You know, if the temperature is small enough, these are cold atoms. And you put other wires to create an external potential, right? And then these other wires with, with, that create a magnetic field, you can change the current in that suddenly and then make a quench and make the whole thing move around. 
Now, what's quite amazing is that you can actually take pictures of these atoms. This is a production, but you can take a picture, you have a camera, and you kind of release the, the, the potentials and all that, and then they, they go into some, some dots, you see dots on the screen, and every dot is about 10 atoms or something like this. So you take actually pictures of these atoms, you have to take away the, the, the external potential, the magnetic field. So you repeat the, the, the experiment many times and take it away, take a picture at different times, you know, and then you get an evolution. That's the idea. And this is the evolution. So we did exactly that little experiment. We have a potential with two uh, minima and then you take it to zero. And uh, there are different curves here. There is the wiggly curve, which is the experiment. There is the dotted curve, which is uh, standard hydrodynamics. So if I go back, uh, which is these equations where the pressure is known for the Liebelinger model. So this is described by Liebelinger model. It is known that these cold atoms are described by Liebelinger model, so kind of integrable. And the, the, the kind of a full curve is a GHD prediction. And you see that the full curve and the usual hydro are completely different. And the full curve agrees with, with the experiment. Well, there's a bit of noise now that. And so this was a kind of first experiment really you know, with cold atoms checking that GHG equations work. And there's been further experiment later on going much more in details and checking the breaking of GHG equation by additional terms that are present in the experiments and all that. And there's kind of a lot of work on this. Question about this. Yeah, exactly. So, so initially, initially, indeed. So you suppose it's a bit of an assumption there, but you suppose that initially your atoms are pretty much at equilibrium at some temperature. So they're just there and standing there. Then you take away the thing and then the, the two bonds expand. You, know. uh, you don't know the initial temperature quite, but you, you have to determine it by other means, but they don't affect the curves a lot, as it turns out. You know the range of temperature more or less. And there's, it is an assumption that initially it is at equilibrium at a certain temperature. You use that to determine your initial state. Uh, it might not be quite at equilibrium, but uh, it seems to be precise enough. Yeah. Another question. Okay, so I don't know how much time I have. Uh, zero, yes, that's what I was thinking. So usually I, I end up there, then I have like a huge amount of other slides <laughs> in case people ask questions and okay. I go to the conclusion. Sorry? Open question. Yeah, exactly. So I just want to go conclusion to what, what's been done, uh, just to say, so a lot of models have been analyzed. So here's a list of models, uh, integrable models, either numerically or to, to some extent with better and ass compared to GHG. The GHG equations themselves have, have their own, they are integrable themselves. So this GHG equation, the, this earlier type equation, integral equation is itself integrable in some way and can be solved in different ways, there's, there's some kind of a social by characteristic. Um, there's a MATLAB package being written to solve these equations in various situations. So you, know, you use MATLAB, put that in, and just do the numerics. Uh, though it still needs a bit of work to, to, to work on it. There's more things that have been calculated, like uh, full quantum statistics and, and uh, transport, fluctuations in transport, um, many point correlation functions. Uh, also, diffusion can be added. So when you have hydro, uh, usual hydro, you have a Navier-Stokes term, which is kind of viscosity. You can also add viscosity. That was viscosity there, so diffusion. It's known how to calculate it. Um, yeah, experimental verification, integrability breaking has been looked at. And then there's been a lot of articles looking at this. So, and I end up with some open questions. Uh, for instance, well, various types of correlation functions are still to be understood, in particular uh, for twist field. Uh, John is a Arnaz is a kind of expert on, on some aspects of that. And there's some relation with uh, GHD here. We have maybe an analysis of GHD equation, like numerically solving this equation. And what can you see? Can you see some turbulence? What, are the, the, what is the phenomenology of this GHD equation going beyond just the Riemann problem? You know, a simple thing. Um, yeah, and higher, oh yeah, higher order beyond diffusion. Can you get third order terms and kind of a dispersion, dispersive term? Uh, exactly, and can you compare that with uh, experiments or uh, uh, soliton gas now? Okay, so yeah, I stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. So we have a question from John. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to ask a question? Let's go to the start. Uh, Anyone else? Yeah, 
<laughs> so you said something about form uh, and Toda. Yes. Model. Yeah. So so the Toda model, which is the absolutely integrable model, was analyzed using GHD. So you can do the same, you know, the same machinery for Toda model. Uh, calculate the delta now this uh, from two body scattering of you know Toda particles. Say, and so it's kind of a, a very simple five line calculation to get the to get the delta, and then you get your hydro. But what's happening there is that, uh, interestingly, there's been this is one case where much more has been done. So, for instance, so in particular, the the um, uh, uh, see the, so the GGEs, so these uh, states, these Gibbs states, uh, have you know the average densities have been calculated there. In fact, this this rule of theta has been related to the spectral density of the Lax operator in the Toda model. So that was the discovery of uh, Herbert Spong. When he looked at that, so you take the lax operator, this analyze it, this the spectral, the, the uh, spectral density, and this row is essentially a spectral density of lax operator, and you can use that actually to go a bit more, to go a bit further. If you actually connected uh, the lax operator and the GG, the the Gibbs ensemble to some results in random matrix theory, in order to get bits of the GG equation, not the full equation, bits of the GG equation. And then you can use other techniques based on uh, hydrodynamic matrix, hydrodynamic matrices, to get uh, to get the current in the Toda model. So there's quite a good understanding in Toda model of all these equations. Classical. Classical, yeah. So it's kind of very simple from the point of view of integrability, actually. I've understood a long time ago, but for the GHD, you know, then you can go a bit further. Uh, still, though, the GHD equation itself is not being derived. It's the average currents that were calculated, but not the GHD equation itself. In the classical Toda model, yeah, and then it's been numerical checks as well. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was a bit, perhaps a bit quick on that, but um, let's just have a picture. So, take 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 a model of interacting particles. The Tuda model can be thought of that way. It's just particle on the line that interacts with some potential. Okay? And so you get the delta by taking the initial condition as being a particle with some momentum, P1, and another with some momentum, P2, at positions which are far from each other, so two particles, and then just solve your Tuda equation. For two particles, relatively simple, actually. See what happens. So they interact, and then they do something, something and then they come out with the same momenta. So the Tuda model, okay. But same momenta, but slightly shifted. So there's a little bit of a shift of, of a position. So if you were to extrapolate your first particle, the straight line, well, it comes out with that momentum, but not exactly on that straight line, there's a shift. Like, like soliton scattering, you know. And that shift is exactly the delta. And it depends on P1 and P2 in general. That's what you have to put in there. Yeah, scattering shift. So in quantum model, you don't quite have that, but you can do wave packets. Send the wave packets. If something happens, come out as wave packets with the shift. So then it becomes a semi classical analysis where the way the shift of the wave packet is the derivative of the log of the two body uh, kind of scattering phase, you know, into the I phi. Yeah. Another question? Yes. So what about going to the other one? Yes. Yeah, so so you do, so there was a something I mentioned there, you so that you can consider integrability breaking terms beyond integrability, right? So in actual model, you have uh, more interaction terms and that breaks integrability. Now, usually when you don't have a way if your model is not integrable, where you know the hydro of this is just this usual three component hydro in one D, right? Particle momentum energy, or just two components if it's relativistic, and momentum energy, right? So there's a there's some kind of um, a crossover from that hydro to the usual hydro with the addition of that term, where constant quantities are broken slowly over time. Let's say, <clears throat> so you can do that. It's actually very interesting because what you find is that the term you have to add is a bit like a Boltzmann collision term. It's something I was telling you yesterday. So um, the, the terms you add, so you, you have here so essentially an equation for particles in phase space, how do it's interacting in phase space, okay? 
And when you do Boltzmann equation, you start with your distribution in phase space and you add collision term type, collision type of terms where the phase space distribution is modified and eventually goes to Gibbs distribution, right? Something similar here for this row of theta xt, this density in phase space, although now it's an interacting thing. This is collision integral, which is a complicated one. You, you have to, it doesn't take many terms. You, you cannot write it in closed form generically, but in principle, you, you have kind of object that you may calculate uh, order by order using integral techniques. Okay? And that's, that is your, um, the modification of the phase space distribution due to uh, kind of interactions that break integrability, like three bodies scattering. Okay? And when you can show that at a very large time, that goes then to your Gibbs distribution where there's just the energy conserved or just energy and momentum. Yeah. So, uh, but there's still a bit of work to be done there to, to um, be able to calculate more precisely these terms and see what regime it works and all that. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. This is integrity breaking, quite a bit of work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, yeah it's, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, one question there is what is the time scale for integrity breaking? In, in, the, in the experiments, you don't see the effect of integrity breaking. You, you, see, you see the, the GHD equation works for a long time, you know, and you don't know, well, eventually if you change your parameters, you may increase them, but you know, typical parameters, it works for a long time. So the time, for, time scale for integrity breaking is very large. Yes, yes, you can, but then you, you have to be careful. I mean, it's hard to calculate where the time is short because you don't have the techniques to really get the correct time scale. You just get it asymptotically. So if it's large, you know how, how it behaves as a function of your parameter when it becomes large. Yes, I, I suppose you can control. So I don't know all the, all the details of what's been done, you know, but uh, in principle, you can control because, for instance, you can. Uh, control how far is your next energy state that tells you that it's not just 1D, but you know, 3D, mm -hmm. and that breaks the negativity. Mm -hmm. So there's been work on that, and uh, people have written some approximation of what the collision integrals should look like for this, and compare with experiment, and yeah, you can make it quite integrity breaking then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again for your talk. <laughs>